Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, IBM, for inviting me to come and uh, speak here at this conference. I'm Michael Bremner. I'm from uh, University of Technology Sydney from the Center for Quantum Software and Information and the Australian Research Council Center for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology. Um, I guess, like everyone uh, here this week, I'll be talking about you know, things we can try and do with you know, near to, maybe not so near term, quantum computers. Um, and this work has been work I've mostly been doing with Ashley Montanaro, who's here somewhere in the audience there, uh, Richard Joza, uh, Sergio Boisho, uh, Dan Shepard, uh, and a bunch of other people from uh, Google and elsewhere. I think Ryan's in the audience here too, so you know, all those people you should talk to about these topics as well. I think we're going to see variations on this slide in almost like every talk uh, this week. But um, you know, we can sort of imagine a potential timeline over the next 10 plus years in quantum computing. Over the next one to two years, various uh, you know, uh, groups have proposed that they should be able to get to around this 50 qubit limit in their devices. So IBM, Google, others are talking about it as well. And the hope is that at around that point, um, you know, establishes some sort of classical to quantum frontier. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about how, that, uh, how we can begin to think about how this is the transition point, sort of between the diff uh, where quantum, there are quantum computations that begin to get very hard to perform on a classical computer. I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, you have a sense of how we can begin to develop applications which go beyond this into this regime over here where uh, the performance of the quantum computer is much less in question than it will be at this sort of 50 qubit regime. So I'm going to talk through some applications where we have pretty good arguments that at around 50 qubits, it should be very hard to classically simulate these devices. But what I'm hoping for is to give you a sense that as we go to higher qubit number with slightly more complicated or slightly, actually slightly more structured problems, um, we can make these sort of arguments much less ambiguous. Um, I'll focus on two aspects of this. So you can imagine over the next few years, um, there's going to be uh, a range of problems people are going to focus on. And I imagine, and we'll hear more about this later today, that people will focus on things like approximate optimizers or quantum simulators. And these are really good things to focus on, obviously, because there's really clear uh, imperatives to those applications. What I'm going to talk about is probably neither of those things, which are maybe a little bit less clear, but maybe a little bit easier to prove mathematically. And I'm going to focus on some level of error mitigation for classes of quantum algorithms, or for classes of quantum circuit, and talk about ways in which you can develop a testable advantage over classical computers. Now, in order to develop applications that can outperform classical computers in the near future, we have to work pretty hard as theorists. Okay? What we need to do is to identify problems where the complexity of the best classical algorithms radically diverges from the complexity of the best of the quantum algorithms that we have for that application. If we're going to develop such an application, um, we have to address a few key issues. The first one is kind of the big elephant in the room is that are quantum computers more powerful than classical computers at all? Okay, any good application which shows such a radical divergence between the classical and quantum complexity of the problem would be a good candidate for being used in a proof that quantum computers can outperform classical computers. Right now, we don't know if that's true. And any such proof would separate P from P space, which would be like the hugest result in complexity theory ever. So we're, we're coming hard up against these very difficult problems in computational complexity. So we have to move into the regime of conjecture. But at the same time, um, you know, it turns out we can say a few things, which is nice. Um, all right, so uh, the second, second question is, of course, which computations do the class on quantum runtimes diverge? And importantly, how many qubits and on what instances does this actually happen? OK. And the question which Jay raised earlier was, can we achieve or uh, perform any of these applications in the near term without any notion of uh, fault tolerance. So, you know, typically when we're doing the, you know, studying the complexity of quantum computers, we imagine we actually have a fault tolerant device. 
when we're talking about complexity, we're talking about asymptotic scaling of systems, not fixed finite size devices. That said, there will be a crossover point, or we expect there will be a crossover point, and the question as to where that is and whether you can achieve that without fault tolerance is you know, still up in the air, well, and we're trying to address it. You can imagine there is a maximum quantum runtime, which, um, you know, when I mean runtime, I mean depth or whatever measure you're going to use for you know, the complexity of your circuit, you know, beyond which the quantum computer is not going to work anymore because there's too much decoherence or too much noise or whatever. The classical runtime, of course, is going to be way longer than that because we can do a lot with classical computers. The point is that you know, we want to be able to aim for applications which land us there before we hit there and when we're on this side of the curve, of the classical curve, and this is a challenge. So in order to do this, we need to find the hardest quantum computations we can perform with the least number of qubits and the least number of gates. As a theorist, you know, our goals for you know, analyzing such applications is to minimize the gate count and the qubit count, understand the influence of errors in these systems, mitigate these errors, and of course, improve the classical simulation algorithms or the classical algorithms for performing that application. So you know, these you know, three things here are probably pushing this curve down towards the left, and that final curve thing there is pushing that curve over towards the right. And we need to understand where these crossing over points really are. So um, this is the work that we've been doing. And our approach to this is, of course, to focus on things which aren't necessarily um, really interesting and uh, actually develop applications, which maybe industry cares about, but rather to focus on things we can actually prove. And to do that, we've been studying uh, randomized circuits and the complexity of randomized circuits. Now, at a very high level, the goal of this research program has been to classify the complexity of quantum circuits um, up to reasonable notions of error in quantum circuits um, via studying the complexity of the probability distributions to describe the outputs of quantum circuits. So if we have a quantum circuit, like here's an example of a quantum circuit down here, you know, you run a quantum circuit, it outputs bit strings of ones and zeros. That's, in a sense, a quantum circuit is doing sampling from these strings of ones and zeros. And you know, a quantum circuit produces samples x with probability p of x. And we're going to study this for random circuits. So like I said, the idea is to bound the complexity of sampling, this process of sampling, by studying the properties of p of x. Now, since the beginning of quantum computing, this is what we've been doing. However, what's changed in the last few years is that we've been able to study the complexity of these probability distributions. And developed a series of te techniques that allow us to say things about um, the complexity of the output of a quantum circuit with respect to notions of error which actually um, are reasonable for experimental quantum computing. Now, by studying random circuits, and, and random circuits are a good candidate for this sort of thing for a number of reasons, but one intuition, and a kind of physics, physics intuition for this, is that random circuits quickly generate you know, a lot of long-range entanglement. Um, now, of course, you can have non-random circuits that do that as well, but the examples you can think of, say Clifford circuits, things like that, rapidly build up entanglement, but they're also very, very structured and very, very easy to simulate. Randomized circuits don't have as much structure, which makes them a, more of a challenge for classical computers to simulate them. All right, so the big breakthrough in this area was made by Aronson and Arkhipov when they studied linear optical systems. So the problem they studied was, you know, what is the complexity of sampling from a randomly chosen linear optical system? Um, so, you know, the input is some single photons. The output is, well, you're just going to measure um, uh, in the Fock basis the output of this linear optical circuit. And their argument established a potential advantage over classical computers, which is based you know, around this sampling problem for optical networks. And really importantly, this advantage holds for approximate sampling. Um, so you know, imagine your, your, your actual device output samples you know, from the probability distribution R of x, whereas you know, the ideal distribution is from P of x. What they were able to show, assuming some conjectures, is that um, you can define a reasonable you know, uh, total variation distance or, or one norm distance between these two distributions. And if a classical computer could, could sample within that distance, then you know, there'd be consequences for computational complexity theory, which are pretty serious. A few years ago, we 
generalize that argument or improved on it uh, by mapping it in some sense to spin systems. Now, the improvement was essentially that we were able to make the argument a lot simpler, which has been very useful for finding generalizations of this problem. So, and the other sense in which we improved it is actually one of the open conjectures we managed to resolve. It just turned out to be a lot easier in spin systems to resolve this problem. Um, the problem that we studied is this problem which has become known as IQP sampling. An IQP circuit is one in which you, know, you have you know, standard input state, you apply a bunch of Hadamards. The non-trivial part of the circuit is completely diagonal and Z basis. So in this case, I think up here we have a circuit which is composed of square root of Z gates, so square root of C phase gates, and T gates. And it's randomly chosen circuit from that set of possible circuits. You know, you perform Hadamards at the end and then you measure. So it has this structure, Hadamards, diagonal Hadamards. What we were able to show is that if if you were to believe you know, two reasonable conjectures, one about the average case complexity of certain statistical mechanical models, and two, which is that the polynomial hierarchy does not collapse, uh, then classical computers cannot simulate this class of circuits uh, to within constant total variation distance, generally. Um, OK, so I guess the most talked about generalization of this problem is what I'm going to call the Google proposal throughout this talk. In that proposal, we considered studying the problem of uh, what is the complexity of sampling from randomized circuits. Specifically, uh, in this paper, we talked about the issue of you know, considering a 7 by 7 lattice of qubits upon which we perform a series of well, random, randomly chosen gates, basically. Um, the actual sequence is uh, somewhat as like you perform Hadamard gates on everything to create a big superposition state. Then you apply a round of C phase gates a round of single qubit gates, which are like T square root X and square root Y gates, another round of C phase gates, and so on. So this, in this particular circuit, these are randomly chosen. There's a few rules in the way we choose these things, but basically they're randomly chosen. Uh, the depth of the circuit is, well, ideally greater than 40. And ideally, the fidelity of each of these operations is like one over the size of the circuit. If the fidelity is roughly that, that roughly guarantees that the total variation distance is roughly a constant. Okay, so that's the goal. And in this proposal, um, well, the best known classical complexity of this problem can be studied by studying the complexity of, you know, computing tensor network contractions on a network generated by, by this kind of thing. Um, and the best known classical complexity for this problem is exponential the number of qubits in the circuit depth. Um, in this paper, we also introduce uh, this notion of cross-entropy benchmarking to try and establish the validity of these circuits. Now, this is a big issue. Establishing the validity of these randomized circuits is going to be a thing I'll talk about a bit more later in this talk. But of course, these are very complex circuits for which we're sampling, take, looking at randomized outputs for, uh, which will occur with probabilities which we can't actually compute easily because that's actually the thing which is defined to be like the hard thing in this circuit. So uh, validating these circuits is not going to be something which is going to be trivial. It's actually quite a, an issue for this kind of problem. Um, the cross-entropy benchmarking works by basically doing heavy numerical testing on smaller size instances of these problems and then doing um, basically an inference test to make sure that the larger distribution is you know, commensurate with what we'd expect on a smaller distribution. Um, in this paper, there's also heavy numerical, numerical testing to establish, well, also the levels of randomness in the circuit, which is important for the complexity theoretic argument. Um, for the benchmarking, and also to understand the point at which these circuits really, uh, when the classical problem begins to get really hard for this, for this class of circuits. Now, I'm going to take a step back a bit and try and explain the theory behind some of this. Um, I'm probably going to aim this at a level which is too high for experimentalists and too low for theorists, so everyone's going to be disappointed. So sorry about that in advance. But you know, we're going to begin from the beginning. What is a quantum computer? Um, so. I find it helpful actually just to have this slide up there so people are all thinking on the same page about terminology. Of course, everyone here knows what a quantum computer is. But you know, a quantum computer is a simple thing. Its input is a classically easy to describe unitary. Um, and you have an input state, which is just like the all zero state, for example. The output is going to be just strings of bits, um, with, which you know, are output by the ideal quantum circuit with probability p of x, you know, given by the usual. Uh, probability rule. Um, 
Normally, we'll consider entangling gates to be able to be active between any pair of qubits. I mean, that's the thing you can do in the lab, right? Like, that's not a big deal. Um, gates are drawn from a finite gate set. So, for instance, T, Hadamard, CZ would be a universal gate set family, which, you know, you'd study. Um, universal gate sets usually have some construction that allows you to implement any unitary assuming arbitrary runtime, ignoring errors. The problem we're studying is what is the complexity of P of X? Sounds really easy. All right, so let's begin to talk about the complexity of P of X. Pretty much since the beginning of quantum computing, we've known that quantum circuits can define uh, these P of Xs to have probability which can be all the way up here. Uh, this is the complexity of gap P or sharp P. I'm going to use the two kind of interchangeably in a lot of contexts in this talk, though actually the difference between them is subtle and important for this talk, so hopefully I don't mess it up too much. But when you want to consider the problem of exactly computing a probability amplitude from a quantum circuit, the complexity really falls into two categories. It can either be very, very easy, which puts the complexity in P. An example would be the Clifford circuits, single, you know, local unitaries on, you know, qubits, things like that. Like, it puts it, you know, squarely in P. The other option is basically it ends up being sharp P hard or, or cap P complete, this problem. Importantly, despite the fact that quantum circuits can define really hard complexities. So I should say sharp P and gap P is like considered to be much more powerful than P. P is all the way down here. We think bounded error quantum computing lives down here. NP is over here. QMA, which is you know, the quantum generalization of NP, you know, is down here. We expect sharp P and gap P to be sort of a superset of these things. Um, and, but really importantly, while these things emerge in quantum circuits, we don't believe that quantum circuits can actually compute these such functions with you know, very high accuracy. In fact, you can almost take them as a definition that the, uh, a quantum circuit can produce you know, polynomial estimates of such functions. Um, that's certainly the case for BQP. That's basically the definition of BQP. The reason for that is because the only way that we can compute P of X given uh, unitary is basically by repeated measurement, right? So you, know, you get samples out of your circuit, and we're going to have to somehow infer what the probability is with which samples occur. Okay? You have to take exponentially many samples typically to be able to do this. The best we can do with polynomial samples is typically a one over poly kind of error. Okay. So you know, these are a bunch of complexity classes over here on the right. Um, the important ones to focus on, I guess, are sharp P and gap P here. Gap P is basically the generalization of sharp P that allows you to add and subtract numbers from one another. Turns out this is a generalization, while for, for the problem of exactly computing things, it's basically they're the same thing if you're allowed poly time reductions. However, when you consider approximations, there's a subtle difference between these two classes. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, Relative error approximation. So just so everyone knows what we're talking about, a relative error approximation is one that looks like that. So say you have an approximation A of X of a function F. It's one such that it's basically you have a, a multiplicative constant. You know, basically it's an error, it's an approximation that scales with the size of the thing which you're trying to evaluate. Okay? So it turns out for quantum circuits that there are classes of you know, functions defined by quantum circuit amplitudes that stay gap P hard even under relative error approximation. Actually, it's all those classes which are gap P complete. It's a property of gap P completeness. This is the thing that can happen. This does not happen for sharp P. Relative error approximations for sharp P problems actually fall down into the third level of polynomial hierarchy. The reason for that is something called Stockmeyer's algorithm. Stockmeyer's algorithm delivers in BPP to the NP. Actually, it should be FBPP to the NP, but whatever. Um, it delivers a, a, a relative error approximation to such functions, basically. Um, okay, so I'm lumping together a whole bunch of results into the one statement here. Um, and morally, it's an argument that began with Terhal and DiVincenzo in 2002, but it's been refined and actually wasn't exactly using the same words or anything, but the, the basic gist of it was the same. And that is that the gap P hardness of relative error approximations for such for, for quantum circuit amplitudes, for, say, constant depth circuits, IQP circuits, linear optic circuits, and any family which is universal, family of circuits which is universal for quantum computation with post-selection, um, yeah, th these things will be gap P hard, okay? This implies that for such families, 
that there are no classical efficient algorithms for, such, uh, for simulating these families that can achieve a multiplicative error bound without a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. Um, you can infer this from the relationship between Stockmeyer's algor algorithm and, and gap P. Um, that's not how all the proofs work in these arguments, but with a bit of work, you can see that basically the arguments actually are interrelated around this fact. Um, now, the randomized sampling, th this statement, importantly, is not about randomized circuits, okay? It's also not about a notion of error, which is something which is really commensurate with what you would have seen in a lab. Okay, quantum computers don't deliver multiplicative error approximations of themselves. They deliver, say, total variation distance approximations or diamond norm-based approximations of themselves. They don't give multiplicative error approximations of themselves, not typically anyway. Um, in order to make a statement about this, we need to introduce another, notion, another concept, and that's this concept of randomized, um, considering randomized circuits. And this was what was introduced by Aronson and Arkhipov. So the quantum random circuit sampling argument essentially says that if there exists sufficiently accurate, efficient classical samples for the output from sufficiently random families of unitaries, Stockmeyer's algorithm can be used to approximate these sort of functions, which could be gap p hard, and this would cause a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. Like I said, sufficiently accurate in this case means with constant one norm distance or constant total variation distance. Roughly, what the argument is saying is that Say you have you know, one of these hard output probabilities of a quantum circuit, or you have a family which defines such a hard one, then there's going to be a set, well, you, you find a set which has the property where, you know, it, through a random choice over that family, you're going to get this property where the output probabilities are not completely uniform, but they're going to be sort of varying just around uniform. They're going to be still quite small, but there's going to be some variation. So it's not exactly uniform. Technically, people say that this output probability distribution is anti-concentrate. Um, the other property is that we want a relatively large set of these output probabilities to have the property that they're sharp p hard. And we're going to argue this sort of by randomization. So if both of these sets are sort of large enough, so on average, you, if you randomly choose from this set, you get this anti-concentration property, and you get the sharp p hardness property at the same time, um, you know, we'll get an overlap here, and if there is overlap, then the average case complexity is, well, we'll say the average case complexity is hard as the worst case complexity. This implies the overlap. Then if that's true, then quantum computers are hard to simulate, and these are families of things which are definitely hard to simulate on classical computers, assuming no collapse of polynomial hierarchy. What we can actually prove looks like this at the moment. So we can identify families which have relative error, which have these, have the sharp, sharp P hardness property for the output probabilities. We can also identify them, found, so the same families anti-concentrate. But all we can do is conjecture, can conjecture that uh, the average case complexity and the worst case complexity actually line up. So th that there's a separation here is, is still a big problem in this area. And it's unlikely to be solved easily. Um, OK, so just to get a bit more concrete, let's talk about an actual, an actual instance of what these sort of theorems look like. So let's return back to this IQP sampling problem I, I mentioned before. We have a randomly chosen, set of, a randomly chosen circuit where you know, the substantive part of the circuit is made up of, say, t and square root, Z gate, square root of control Z gates that have been randomly chosen. Um, and what the sort of statement we make is that if the average case complexity um, to the complex temperature Ising model partition function I'll get to that in a second. If that's sharp p hard, then quantum computers cannot be efficiently classically simulated with a constant total variation distance without a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. And random choices across this circuit, if you choose enough of these random circuits, you'll hit hard instances, basically. Now, why do I say complex temperature? Uh, why, do I, why am I talking about partition functions up here? It's because we can associate that these output probabilities are always equivalent to a partition function for a complex temperature Ising model. So in order to establish the complexity of these things, what we're studying is the complexity of complex temperature Ising models. So in this case, if we choose these sets of things, what we're actually considering is imagine a complete graph. We're going to assign edge and vertex weights to this graph. And we're going to use that to define an Ising model on that graph. The complexity of this problem depends on the average case complexity of evaluating the partition function of these models. 
Okay, um, there's another problem here, which is based on the ground gaps of degree three polynomials. I won't get into that in this talk. Um, this year, or late last year, we um, improved this argument. So instead of drawing things over a complete graph and randomly you know, adding edge and vertex weights, we now consider sparse graphs. The advantage for that, well, there's two advantages for that. One, it's a different complexity theoretic conjecture, and actually it might be one which is stronger. And the second advantage to this is actually in terms of implementation, this is like actually a pretty big saving. So this, these sort of things typically have n squared gates. The other one has more like uh, n log n gates. That's actually a pretty huge saving in the number of gates will be required to actually implement this. Okay. Um, now, to take a look at the Google proposal, what is this actually saying? So the, the complexity of this problem is dependent. It turns out that the output probabilities of these, well, there's two conjectures. One is that the output probabilities of specifically choosing from this class of circuits anti-concentrate. That's been heavily numerically tested. You can actually prove it for larger depth circuits for this uh, more concretely. Um, but I don't think this is really in question. Like, you can really easily test that these things have this anti-concentration property across these families of circuits, like numerically. Um, the second point is that the average case complexity of the complex temperature partition function of class of three-dimensional Ising models is as hard as the worst case complexity. So each of the output probabilities from this circuit can be related to a three-dimensional Ising model. These are chosen at random by basically your choices of gates. It's a bit hard to write down, so I haven't written it up there. But it's three-dimensional. Basically, you have two dimensions, which are defined by the lattice of qubits. And the third dimension is basically a time dimension, which comes from the choices of random gates in the circuit. OK. Likewise, you can, instead of relate similar classes of circuits, for instance, to other problems which are uh, you know, capable of describing universal families of circuits, for instance, the Jones polynomials. I won't get into that, but that's yeah, something we did in the paper recently. You can go ahead and play this game for many families of circuits and for many variations of circuit, many variations of circuit families and many variations of sharp p hard functions. Um, in the last couple of years, people have really begun to populate this table based around studying the prop anti concentration properties of families of circuits, so these randomization properties, and also like the complexity of uh, output probabilities of these circuits. So, um, you know, basically the starting point is you need to prove output probabilities of sharp p hard. And then what you want to do is to go away and prove that your family of circuits have these sufficient randomization properties of a certain kind. Um, a few really noteworthy examples, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is these cases where we have, uh, say, constant depth circuits. Um, or, uh, yeah, like I said, the, the Google case is a case where we have randomized circuits where basically the output probabil probability distributions are chaotic or look like Porter Thomas distributions. OK. Um, really importantly, um, none of these models have made, really made any progress on the problem of sharp p, the, the average case complexity of the sharp p hardness of these problems up to relative error approximations. And we know from uh, Scott Arrington's paper last year with Li Zhi Chen is that any proof of this is likely to require non relativizing techniques, which pretty much firmly says that this is actually going to be quite a hard problem. So progress towards relating these worst case complexity conjectures to average case complexity, sorry, progress on mapping the worst case complexity of a problem to the average case complexity of these problems over these random choices of circuits is likely to be a difficult problem to resolve. OK, so I'm going to sort of change tack a little bit now and try and talk a little bit about implementation and how these different notions of um, space and time trade off for these sort of problems. OK, so I mentioned earlier that um, we showed recently that um, you can run these randomized sampling arguments for what we call sparse IQP circuits. Um, so sparse IQP circuits are those which are defined by sparsely chosen um, Ising models. Or, yeah, well, basically they're defined by sparsely chosen Ising models. Well, the first thing we had to do was to prove that such circuits have this anti-concentration property. That's that they're sufficiently random. So that's something you can do by um, convincing Ashley to compute a lot of you know, roots of unity or something. And so he did that. And we proved that it anti-concentrates. Um, and then that argument established, because we already knew that you had this uh, sharp p hardness property, or this relative error approximation is a sharp p hard property for this family of circuits. You can combine these things to get this argument that they're hard to classically simulate, assuming the average and worst case complexity you know, line up. Now, importantly, um, 
So this, this construction has, it turns out, has you know, n log n two cubic gates. That's just what pops out of this argument. Um, you can, okay, so they're, they're defined in terms of potentially long range gates um, with all commuting interactions. Okay, so what we're gonna consider instead is how, what that looks like if you're gonna implement that with a universal, you know, uh, with a universal set of um, gates. Well, what you can do is you can use an edge coloring algorithm to decompose the circuit into order log n partitions of simultaneous gates. And in each of, each one of these partitions, you're doing about order n gates simultaneously, which can be performed, basically. Then sort of by running sort of standard arguments on sorting networks from the classical theory of sorting networks, each of these partitions can be implemented with depth square root n in a universal nearest neighbor architecture. Okay, so you know, you're gonna have an architecture like that where all the interactions are nearest neighbor and the qubits can talk to each other in the nearest neighbor way and you get the overall depth is like square root n log n. Okay, so this is neat for, from an implementation's point of view but from a theoretical point of view it's actually somewhat interesting and gives you a sense of how the time space trade-offs work for these arguments. All right, so if you were to take a sort of standard tensor network argument standard tensor network algorithms for computing the output probabilities of these circuits. You can compute these probabilities in time, which is like the minimum of sort of order two to the n or order two to the little d times big D, where little d is the depth of the circuit and big D is the diameter of the circuit, okay? Um, now, if there were a sub square root n depth argument or a circuit for implementing this kind of well, particularly this class of circuits, then it would imply that via these sort of algorithms that there is a uh, sub-exponential time algorithm for computing the output probability of these circuits. Now we know particularly for this family of sparse IQP circuits that actually these can be related to Ising models which turn out to have, um, to be hard for the exponential time hypothesis. Okay, which means that, what that means is that if we would assume that there are any problems in NP that take exponential time, then these do too, basically. There are instances where these do too. Now, if there were sub square root n um, depth circuits for implementing these models, then you would have a sub exponential time algorithm for computing these, uh, these hard functions. Hence, this bound is essentially optimal for IQP circuits. That's the lowest depth circuit you can have that will implement this sort of thing, okay? Um, all right, now, you can also consider implementing these models via measurement-based quantum computing or some other technique like that. So we can start considering, say, constant depth circuits for running these quantum simulation algorithms. And there's been a series of papers which have done that. Um, one way of considering this is to say, take the Google proposal and consider it as, being, as this random family of circuits is emerging from randomized measurements on say something like a cluster state and there'll be some subset of circuits or some subset of qubits for which these circuits begin to appear at random. Now, um, the complexity of the overall system is then basically bounded by the complexity of this subsystem, okay? Now, but the exponential time hypothesis basically is bounding now our capacity to uh, um, run a simulation on these systems. What I'm trying to say is that basically, if you move to a 2D nearest neighbor architecture, say with constant depth, you're going to have a polynomial increase in the number of qubits you're going to need in order to be able to solve in, in order to be able to solve the same sort of classes of problems with the same sort of complexity. So we're always going to have this trade-off between the depth of the circuit and the you know, um, size of the system for these sort of problems. Yeah, so for instance, below the square root in depth, you begin to trade qubits versus gates. So yeah, if you go to constant depth, you have a polynomial increase in the number of qubits for these classes of problems. So this raises the question again, like where is this quantum frontier, right? Where is this difference between classical and quantum computing? So one thing we can do is to sort of classically test via um, you know, what is the best classical simulation argument, algorithms we have for doing these things. And so you, know, you end up with this argument like around 50 qubits, for instance, for the Google model. Actually, it turns out for the IQP, sparse IQP case, it's around 60 or 70 qubits. And we'll hear later in the week that it's around 50 photons or above 50 photons for boson sampling problems as well. Okay. 
Um, now, these things are affected by the choice of the hard problems we're considering, um, the classical runtime, but also they're going to depend on the noise, the amount of noise in the circuit. So we considered the problem of, of measurement depolarization noise in IQP circuits, and we were able to show that there's a, a quasi-polynomial quasi quasi time algorithm for simulating these circuits if you have a constant depolarizing rating each qubit. Now, physically, you know, that's kind of the best case scenario for a noise model that you can expect, is a constant rate of depolarization or something like that. So this is basically an argument that the physical situation is something asymptotically you'd be able to simulate in these circuits. Now, it's important to understand, though, as well, that asymptotically, if you have a constant rate of, say, depolarizing noise like this, the distance between your ideal quantum circuit and the thing you have in the lab is radically departing from one another. Like, they're radically diverging. So, you know, the distance is going to grow, like, at least n for this kind of error model for this kind of system. In order to get inside this regime where you can argue you have a constant total variation distance separation between these circuits, you need to sort of set a threshold level which says, you know, above this number of qubits, it doesn't make sense to be considering doing this kind of thing, you know, without something like fault tolerance. You know, and that threshold level will be something like, you know, the inverse of the number of qubits or the circuit size or something like that, the number of elements of things which could go wrong in your circuit. Um, importantly, actually, so this, this argument can actually be extended to the Google model as well. Ashley is going to talk a bit more about that, I think, later on Friday, so I won't go into the details of that algorithm too much. Oh, yeah, and I've got an advertisement there. Now, what I do want to talk about, though, is that under this noise model, it turns out in these IQP circuits that you can have a semi-classical notion of error correction, which completely corrects this class of noise, this family of noise. Uh, this idea um, basically came from a representation you can have for these IQP circuits, which is closely related to uh, binary linear codes. Now, let me just try and talk you through that a little bit. Imagine you have you know, any of these sort of IQP circuits. You can write, it down, write them down. Um, you can write down a, a linear binary matrix, um, so your matrix of ones and zeros, which describes basically where the gates are in your circuit. Okay, one thing you can do is assume you basically have the, well, in this case, I don't have the same theta, but you can basically assign the same theta for, to every circuit. And then what you're going to do is, Say, actually, in the case of these circuits, that theta would be pi over 8. OK? So what this matrix CJK is is a matrix of 1s and zeros. When you have, say, a T gate, you put a 1 there. OK? So uh, if you had, say, n qubits, so it'll be a, you know, um, L by n uh, qubit matrix, uh, L by n bit matrix, L by n matrix, sorry, um, where you'll have L rows, and each row is basically describing a gate in this system. So it turns out if you just apply a classical error correcting code to that matrix, then that classical error correcting code will be able to correct this noise family in this class of circuits. Um, and what I mean by classical error correcting code, I really mean you're basically multiplying the generator matrix of well, we are multiplying this matrix by the generator matrix of the class of code for that, <coughs> yeah, for the code that you're considering. If you do this, you end up with a bigger circuit, a more complex circuit, but that circuit has the interesting property that it, is, you can use a completely classical decoder on your, argument, on your algorithm. So basically, uh, for any IQP circuit, you can run this a classical error correcting code on the description of the circuit, and basically any good code will work. And by good, I mean it's actually an error correction code that can correct errors. Um, this is specifically for this noise model, though, I should point out. Um, the reason for this is in part because basically, if you have depolarizing at the end of one of these circuits, it basically looks like bit flip errors on, on the sample space of these circuits. Okay? So those bit flip errors, in some sense, are basically just a classical error on the system. Um, like I said, any good code will work. Uh, if, you know, this unitary will be, um, or say if you use a bit flip code, yeah, you, you pick up a log n factor. Um, yeah, Shannon's noiseless coding theorem implies there's a constant overhead. Could be found, but that's for like a randomized coding thing, which may not be so physical to implement. Um, like I said, DM is potentially much more complicated than D. 
uh, because actually this encoding process might involve creating more complicated gates. However, like so you might go for a two qubit gate thing to a thing which allows for n qubit gates, but like I said, the overhead's not going to be dramatic. Okay, now this brings me to this problem of verification. So I said earlier, for these randomized circuit sampling arguments, one of the issues we're going to have is actually verifying that our randomized circuit sampler is producing the thing it's claimed to be producing. Um, in general, we can expect that complete black box verification is likely going to be just something which is generally too hard to do. So beyond circuits for which we can do a lot of numerical testing, it doesn't make heaps of sense to be thinking about trying to verify these circuits. However, what we can do um, is, you know, think about systems as not actually being black boxes because they're not. They're going to be things that we can actually probe and test in other ways. So we can get a degree of confidence that our system is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But if you don't want to actually you know, run that sort of argument, there are other things we can consider as well. Uh, as we said in the, in the Google proposal, um, you, know, you can make fidelity estimates via this cross-entry benchmarking. Though, as I said earlier, this requires you a lot of numerical testing, and you're going to have to compute very hard functions on the way to doing this. And for a large and large system size, this is a problem. Likewise, um, Aronson and Chen considered this heavy output generation problem, which likely runs into a similar problem. It requires computing the median of a complex circuit, which could be something which is computationally difficult to do. What I want to talk to you about now, just as I'm finishing up this talk, is a different approach based on sampling from basically pseudo-random circuits, in which case we're going to hide, basically run a cryptographic protocol, which will not exactly verify your circuit completely, but can give you a degree of confidence that your, your classical circuit or your, your quantum system is actually behaving as, as planned. So I said before that you can encode these IQP circuits in terms of a binary matrix, C, which basically describes where the gates are in the circuit. It turns out for IQP circuits, the output probability of a given sample is dependent on the weighted numerator polynomial of this code. OK, oh, sorry. When I say code, I mean there's this matrix. You can think of this matrix as being a generator for the generating matrix of a code. OK, so the columns of that matrix will be the, you know, um, the basis for that code. OK? Um, if you choose this matrix C carefully, you can determine certain properties of P of X and the weighted numerator polynomial of that code. Typically, you won't be able to compute P of X for all the same arguments I've been talking about all the way through this talk. But if you have a carefully chosen family of codes, you can, well, not necessarily maybe be able to compute P of X, you might be able to determine certain things about it, which are things that you can actually maybe test experimentally or probe experimentally. So importantly, while sampling X might be you know, hard, it isn't always hard to detect a bias in a set of samples. That is, for some, you can imagine setting some bit string S, it can sometimes, you can sometimes determine with what probability, say, output samples from your circuit are orthogonal to that bit string. So that problem can generally be considered, you know, dramatically easier than the problem of determining, you know, the output probability of a circuit or whether you will get particular strings of a certain frequency. Okay. Um, now, we can use such properties to create a cryptographic protocol to hide, you know, such biases by basically creating a private public key pair. So you can imagine a scenario where, you know, Alice is a classical player and she's going to define a circuit. She wants, you know, Google or IBM or whoever else to, to run. And they're going to share with them the public key, which is paired with this private key. Um, this randomization, pro, you know, then they'll be able to analyze the samples coming back from, from the hardware vendor in order to test whether you know, the correct biases occur with the correct probability. So we considered this problem about 10 years ago. Long, it was a simpler time in 2008. We weren't thinking about actually anyone ever doing this. We just were playing around a bit and trying to see how things were. In those days, things were different. We had like keys on phones. Blackberry still made phones. So do they still make phones? Anyway. Dave Bacon was at quantum computing conferences. It was weird. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the actual protocol we based around a specific family of code. So I'll run through the actual protocol, but um, the reason I wanted to bring it up is because it's probably be generalized and improved on. This is something we came up with 10 years ago. Basically, no progress has happened since then, but I thought it should be pointed out so that people understand it. So we, we based this problem around quadratic residue codes. The reason why we consider quadratic residue codes is because they have the property that they're 
they're basically a parity bit short of being self-dual. And self-dual code for have a nice property, which basically says that you can, um, it can, you can define a code word for which um, there is going to be a distance which is like always orthogonal to, to the sample space of that code. Now, specifically what we did was you choose a large prime Q, which is 7 mod 8, basically, to define a quadratic residue code of length Q and rank, which will be Q plus 1 over 2. So that's the Q over here. So the column space is the thing which generates the code, OK? And the rank of that code will be given by R. In this case, it's 1 plus Q over 2. Q is an example of a singly punctured double even code. And as quadratic residue codes are, because quadratic residue codes are apparently a bit short of being self dual, okay? That feature allows us to define a private key for this problem. Um, in this case, the private key, is, one way of seeing it is to basically, you, you add basically a string of ones down the left hand side of the leftmost, leftmost column. Then what we're going to do is basically randomly choose another matrix R, another binary matrix R down here. It's just got no properties, just randomly choose it. And then you're going to pad the rest of the matrix with zeros. OK, what this does is define a direction which is orthogonal between this code, well, this set and that set. OK? Oh, I've said it up here. This defines a string S, which the, it turns out for an IQP circuit that the probability of x.s equaling 0 turns out to be 85%. This is something you can do for your analysis of the properties of this code. Now, the problem is like, how well is that hidden? Oh, I should also say then finally you randomize. Like you, you set this thing up, you basically apply any randomized linear transformation. The overall rank of this thing will be one, so you could do something like um, column echelon reduction on this, which will randomize the process, and you can delete a column and then present that to your experimentalist and say, hey, do that circuit. Um, if you do a second order cryptanalysis as Hamiltonian, i.e. The, the row space of this generator C, um, it suggests that randomized samples will avoid S with probably around 75%, not 85%, which is what you get out of your quantum circuit. So if you don't have any knowledge about S, basically the best thing you can do by analyzing the Hamiltonian, as far as we know, is to output things which probably 75%. This is assuming you don't just straight up have a way of classically simulating that circuit. Now, this is before anyone was talking about these randomized sampling arguments. So conjecture one, which was in that paper, is that sampling from randomized IQP circuits is classically difficult. Well, we kind of have that. It's actually for a different family of circuits, but this is sort of the argument that we've been able to make. Conjecture two is that with high probability of this procedure, um, C cannot be distinguished from a random binary matrix. Okay? So you run through this kind of procedure. This in principle, should have no properties which distinguish it from a random binary matrix. And that's the second conjecture we have. And conjecture three, um, you know, if that doesn't hold, is that S cannot be found in poly time given C. OK? Um, conjecture three actually would Im imply conjecture two. So the example we generated, the, well, we sort of ran this argument, but we also generated an example. And it had, um, well, R equal 244. Uh, it's a 244 qubit example, um, so that's a lot of qubits, okay? And that's sort of the smallest, really non-trivial example we're able to generate with this family of codes. Um, and the other problem is that the gatehouse is quite high, so it's definitely more than 1,000. It's going to depend on your architecture and how you do it, but it's well more than 1,000. So this argument proposes some obvious challenges. Um, firstly, like prove the above conjectures in some sense. Um, Second challenge is make this easier. So we chose a specific family of codes because um, we needed this property that uh, it was like um, a parity bit short of being self-dual, self and quadratic residue codes have that property. However, you could consider other families of error correcting codes, for instance, for this class of problem. Um, this is one obvious thing that people can actually look at. There's a lot of different self-dual codes out there. Um, and yeah, like I said, find new examples and make this easier. And if you want to see the details of that, go back and look at this paper from, on the archive from 2008. So it's kind of a million years ago. All right, so this brings me back to the beginning, which is at the end. And hopefully now you've got a bit of a sense of um, how we can go from uh, this regime, where we have this crossover point between classical and quantum computation, where we can begin to define problems which are really hard for classical computers on around 50 qubits, but 
we can begin to move up into this regime where things get much less, and I'm much less ambiguous. We'll have, by introducing things like error mitigation and validation of the problems we're considering. In both cases, this problem requires taking randomized problems and beginning to add more structure to these, to these systems via the use of, say, error correcting codes or, the, in that final example, via cryptographic you know, procedure. Also happens to be related to you know, error correcting codes. All right, um, this leaves a bunch of open questions. And I guess, for me, one of the biggest open questions out there in this whole space is you know, can we use these techniques for getting bounds on the complexity of quantum circuits to prove advantage over classical algorithms for more structured problems? So I gave the examples r roughly there in terms of a cryptographic problem. However, you, know, you could imagine trying to leverage these lower bound techniques for problems such as optimization or for more general quantum simulations. For instance, those constant depth version of these sampling arguments where you, you base these information-based quantum, compu quantum computing are an example of an argument which shows for a deterministically chosen you know, quantum simulation, that is the simulation that produces cluster states, that you know, these are hard to classically simulate. Can you do this though for other models? That's, that's the thing which is definitely worth considering. Uh, the other question is how much noise is too much noise? When do we need error correction and when can we make do without it? Um, the other big question is more generally how many qubits are required to outperform classical computers for other tasks? Okay, so we're making, we've sort of made the argument around 50 is hard for these randomized circuit sampling problems, maybe a bit higher if we have better classical algorithms, but what about other problems as well? Like it's worthwhile examining this kind of question across many families of algorithms. The final hard problem is, yeah, um, how do we attack this open average case complexity conjectures and can we say anything more about it than we actually have? Okay, one of the rationales, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but for relating these randomized circuits to the Jones polynomial was because we can introduce via that construction a notion of depth, um, which doesn't exist, say, for these IQP cases where the maximum depth of a circuit is like n squared. Okay. I think I might end there, so thank you very much. Okay, some questions for Michael. I've got a question for you. Are, are you using anti-concentration in the sense of um, chaos and scrambling, or do you mean something distinct? I didn't catch your definition. Yeah, so it's, it's the same, same, same thing, yeah, basically, yeah. So I was trying to understand the, uh, the classical complexity that you were describing for the, hi, here. hi okay. okay, yeah, for, for the Google proposal, yeah. um, in terms of the analysis of the tensor network, and um, so was the classical complexity, you're quoting the worst case complexity, and the, the reason why I bring this up is if you, use random circuits, um, you know, you create a random tensor network, and, and random tensor networks are, in a certain sense, simpler than typical, than special tensor networks, because, you know, they have a, a uh, injectivity property, which means that they, that whether or not they're contractible is dependent only on the spectral gap of their parent Hamiltonian. So there's, they are, in some ways, more easily characterized than the worst case tensor networks. So, um, I'm wondering if you thought about the special things which happen with random tensor networks in... I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certain things you can compute, right, to bound it. So generally, it'll still be exponentially hard to compute, we think, anyway, randomized so it, tensor networks. Yeah, I mean, networks. the worst case, but are you then making a statement about the average properties of yeah. the spectral gap of right. the parent Hamiltonian? Well, I wouldn't put it that way, but what I would say is that we're making a statement about the average case properties, but we're conjecturing that. That's the point which is being conjectured. Okay. okay so so conjecture. the conjecture is that for these classes of circuits, that the average case complexity of the a relative error approximation, so a good heuristic for those sort of problems, is still going to be sharply hard asymptotically. Okay. So, so the classical cost that you're putting down is a conjectured cost. Uh, yeah, totally. Oh, okay. oh right. yeah, yeah, like absolutely. Like so, that lower bound is definitely conjectured. I see. Okay. Um, in that case, so what's interesting about say that case, if you go to higher depth for those classes of problems, it's then 
in some sense a conjecture about, you could also make it a conjecture about, say, the average case complexity of computing these output probabilities of typical quantum circuits. Um, and I d I, that's pretty unresolved, right? We actually don't have a good answer to that problem. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Michael.